This episode goes out to Karina in Budapest. Hi there, Garrett Robinson here. Welcome to the 10th episode of the Nightblade Epic Podcast Season 2. Wow, it's been an incredible week since we announced the release of A Cloak of Red, the next brand new novel of Underrealm. So many of you have come from on the podcast, the Facebook group, the YouTube channel, and all across the internet in excitement about the new story. And you know what? We get it. We're pretty excited too. As of now, we're just over 10 weeks away from the book's release. We mentioned it last week, but just to reiterate, you should go to underrealm.net slash TTK now to pre-order your copy. Pre-orders mean the world to us. They're a huge help to our marketing, and they help us know what projects you're excited for. You can pre-order the first book in ebook, paperback, and hardcover as well. And if you pre-order a print copy, we're going to do our best to ship it so that it arrives at your door on the day of release. So go to underrealm.net slash TTK now and pre-order your copy. Again, that's underrealm.net slash TTK. Okay, now it's time for today's episode. Today, you're getting chapters 13 and 14 of Mystic. When we left off... Lauren and her friends had made a narrow escape from the town of Redbrook and were fleeing west along the Dragon's Tail River from the family Yeren. Enjoy! Mystic, Chapter 13 So began their voyage to Wellmont, which Lauren swiftly decided was the most miserable time she had spent since leaving the Birchwood. It began pleasantly enough. The river remained calm and peaceful, and a gentle wind remained ever at their backs. For the first few days, Brimlad would trade his duty at the tiller with Zane, and the wizard took to the work with the ease of long familiarity. Lauren wondered why he seemed so acquainted with watercraft, and how he knew Brimlad. Yet she feared to delve too deeply into the wizard's past. He had little patience for such things, and she did not wish to breach another sensitive topic as she had done with his son. But the pleasant calm of the voyage soon turned to monotony, and with little activity to occupy their attention, their thoughts turned to dark wonderings about their pursuers. Little did Lauren think that the family Yaren would simply let them escape without incident. Surely there would be ships after them even now, Brimlad assured them that, with Zane's wind to help them, few vessels in Redbrook could catch his boat on the open water. Still, Lauren often found herself looking warily behind them. Zane cast his winds whenever the natural wind died, while Lauren and Jem took to the oars often, but their efforts only worsened another problem. They were desperately low on food. Brimlad had stored enough provisions for himself and more, certainly, but held his passengers responsible for providing their own foodstuffs. There had been no chance for that in their escape, so they rationed carefully and slept hungry each night. "'How long will it take us to reach Wellmont?' Lauren asked Zane on the first day of their journey, shortly after dawn rose pink behind them. "'Almost three weeks.' Zane had turned away from the sun, and deep shadows filled every pocket of his face. Lauren thought he looked more gaunt than he had before, but it could have been her imagination. And how much food do you think we have? If we barely keep ourselves from starving? Mayup two weeks? Zane said it without emotion. Lauren shivered. On the third day they stopped at a small fishing village nestled against the river. There they spent the last of Annis's coin on food, but in their haste they did not bargain as well as they might have, and barely bought enough to fill their bellies for three weeks. Still, this improved their mood until two days after their purchase, when they woke to find the fish spoiled and rotten. "'Curse those fishermen and their families for six generations!' spat Brimlad. "'When I return this way, I will crack their skulls!' I am sure you shall, 
said Zane, but we cannot do so now, and I find the rest of our voyage more pressing. I have some fishing line, but it is ill-used and not likely to do us much good. Still, we can try. Lauren knew something of fishing, which she had done often with Chet beneath the boughs of the birchwood, so the duty fell to her. All day she would sit at the boat's rear, dangling a bone hook in the water behind them with some scrap of meat upon it. But the first day she caught only one fish, and on the second, none at all. As day after day passed and all on the boat grew hungrier and hungrier, they turned to conversation to distract themselves. In particular, Zane held intense, whispered counsels with Lauren, in which he again spoke of the mage stones and urged Lauren to join him in his mission. Surely you cannot deny my need for justice. If nothing else, help me rescue my son. I would need little to do it. A few of the stones would suffice. I have told you they are not mine to give, said Lauren. But Annis listens to you the wizard insisted, frustration growing in his voice. And if you will not help me, neither will she. Lauren thought hard. How can I know, wizard, that if we gave you the mage stones, you will not use them to strike down your foes? I hear the anger and pain in your voice when you speak of Driston and the Grand Magister. Can you swear an oath that you will bring them to no fatal harm? Zane glared at her. What are they to you? I have told you how they wronged me, and even the children have told you of the ill repute of that clan. All of you have told me this, yes, said Lauren, and yet what have I seen for myself? Do you trust nothing but your own eyes? Why should I believe anything else? And even if I did, why should I raise my hand against them, when to avoid them altogether is easier, and does not require any bloodshed? Zane surrendered with a frustrated growl, as he always did, and left Lauren alone on the boat for two whole days. He avoided her eyes whenever they found themselves sharing the deck. Lauren did not know whether the wizard talked to Jem, but soon the boy came to speak to her as well. He tried to make it seem natural, sitting beside her in silence a long while before he broached conversation. But Lauren could feel the tension in him and she saw him fidget with his hands and feet, as together they watched the distant river bank coasting by. From somewhere far ahead they heard shouts from a trading vessel sailing downstream. I have meant to ask you something, ever since we found that force of sellswords with the mystic, he said at last. Lauren felt a qualm of anxiety. The mercenaries, Jordel had said, most likely made for Wellmont, the very city that was now their destination. With any luck, she hoped they could reach Wellmont and leave it again before the mercenaries reached it, but still it made her uneasy. But she said none of this to Jem, and only showed him an open hand. Ask me then, but know that if your question angers me, I will not hesitate to pitch you into the water. Jem scooted away from her. You know I cannot swim! She snickered and gave him a playful shove. I jest, little master. What do you want to know? You cannot think to go through your whole life without harming another. Lauren glanced at him, unsure what to say. That is not a question. Mayhap not, but you avoid an answer. You know what I mean to say. I have not failed to defend myself or others when necessary. Even Zane forgets that I planted an arrow in my father's leg to save his life. But that does not mean either that I will kill anyone. Killing is a judgment, and not one for me to make. But why? said Jem. Can you not see that you are the only one holding to your rules, and with them you place yourself at unfair disadvantage? Lauren shrugged. What of it? When stems this insistence of yours that I play by the rules you deem fit? If I have made a poor choice, it is mine to make. Jem's brow furrowed. I do not ask for some idle debate. Do you mean to end up dead by some stranger's blade? Because that is the only outcome I see for you, as foolishly as you have comported yourself since we met. Before Lauren could reply, soft footsteps approached. Annis came to sit beside them, 
settling on Lauren's left while Jem remained on her right. A quick glance told Lauren that Zane sat at the ship's other end, and though he did not face them, she saw he kept an ear cocked towards the conversation. Mayhap she was right to suspect the question did not come from Jem. Well, Lauren would not play his game. "'Have you given much thought to your course after Wellmont? she asked Jem, rather than answer his last words. "'I had not finished my question,' said Jem. "'I have, for I said all I mean to. Now, where will you go once we leave the city?' "'Somewhere with an endless supply of food I never have to pay for,' quipped Annis. Lauren laughed, and even Jem smirked, but their humor was dampened as their stomachs gurgled in concert, like a choir of minstrels. "'Casting aside all jest,' said Lauren, turning to Annis, "'what will you do after Wellmont? Have you even decided?' Annis shrugged. "'I mean to go to Kalenton, as you said. But what then?' Annis looked perplexed. "'There I will hide, until I am but a distant memory to my mother and all my family. What else could I do?' Lauren stared at her. "'You mean to just remain there? And do what? Well, live, I suppose.' I still hold hope that we can fetch a good price for our cargo. She gave a meaningful look and patted her cloak, beneath which Lauren knew she still had the mage stones. If we can, I would purchase a simple house, far from prying eyes. I could raise my own food, or buy enough to stay comfortable. Mayhap even find some handsome young man and marry him. Her eyes darted to Jem, and she giggled. The boy still stared out at the river, oblivious. Marriage, he scoffed. The useless binding of oneself to another for all your life, when you have known them for but a sliver of it. If I made it rich, I would buy a house, certainly, and I am sure I would keep many lovers there. But to promise myself to just one? He grunted a laugh. Annis's cheeks grew darker. You speak very plainly of such things, for such a young child, she said and Lauren could hear the irritation in her voice. Jem's face darkened. Lauren remembered what he had told her beneath the streets of Cabras, about Auntie and the way she treated the children who worked for her. The boy knew more than Annis might guess. Lauren interrupted the conversation with a sigh, leaning back on her hands. I cannot envision myself in a life of idle luxury. Not yet, at any rate. I would go mad sitting about a house all day. There is too much I wish to do, too much in the world waiting to be seen. Jem snorted. Of course, you want the life of an infamous thief, for reasons I shall never understand. But how do you mean to reach it? Lauren looked at him in confusion. Why, what do you mean? Just that. He means, Anna said, her voice ringing with authority. How do you mean to get there? Will you simply stroll into the next great city you see and try to liberate the wealthy of their gold? Do you really believe that would work? You have seen less of the Nine Lands than even me. Do you think a great thief springs full-formed into the world, without years of training and many brushes with danger? Well, they must start somewhere, said Lauren, annoyed. Yes, and that is the point, said Jem. Where will you start? Let me ask this. Where will you go next? I do not mean so simple an answer as fleeing from Annis' mother or escaping the grasp of Jordell. Where will you go? Lauren's annoyance grew still further. Anywhere I please. I am bound to no one. Jem only sighed and shook his head. Annis rose and primly dusted her filthy skirts, seemingly unaware of the gesture's futility. It is as I thought. You have no more direction than a wandering chick fresh from the nest. You would be better off following me to Kalenton, at least to start. Annis strode towards the ship's bow, and when Lauren turned to Jem, she found the boy had risen to follow. She sat alone, leaning with her elbows on her knees, staring out at the water. And at last, she caught a glimpse of the truth. She had no idea in the world where she wanted to go nor how to find out. The river whispered to itself below her, giving no answer. 
Mystic, Chapter 14 Two weeks into their voyage, everyone on board had grown irritable with hunger. Lauren spent much of her days curled up on a coil of rope Brimlad kept near the ship's bow, trying to avoid speaking to anyone to keep herself from growing angry. The captain yelled as often as he spoke in a normal voice. Jem and Annis's bickering was simply insufferable. Zane stayed silent for the most part, and rarely could he muster the strength to bolster the ship's small sails with a gust of wind. Lauren feared to dip her fishing line in the water, for the disappointment of an empty day made the occasional reward of a finger-long fish seem less than worth it. And then, on the sixteenth day, they spotted the sail approaching behind them. It was Jem who saw it first. Lauren noticed the boat had grown curiously quiet, and looking up, she saw the boy standing at the boat's rear rail, unmoving as his gaze remained fixed behind them. She almost looked away again, relieved at the silence, but there was something in his posture, a tense, fearful sense of anticipation, that captured her attention. Jam? she called out. What is it? A cloud pursues us. Only I do not think it is a cloud. Brimlad whirled on the spot, shoving the tiller into Zane's hand and going to Jem. Lauren rose from the deck to join them. Annis remained where she was by the railing, barely raising her head to see. Who cares if there is a cloud? she said. I would welcome a little rain, if only to relieve this unbearable heat. Remove your cloak, then, snapped Jem. Lauren slapped him, lightly, on the back of his head. She searched the horizon behind them, towards which the river curled and twisted like a long, shimmering snake. They had sailed around a long bend in its course, so that three leagues of river were now only a league east of them as the crow flew, and the land around which the river turned was low and wet. There at the start of that wide bend, Lauren spied what Jem had seen. A small white shape hovered above the horizon, tilting slightly back and forth. It was fuzzy and indistinct to Lauren's eye, and indeed looked quite like a cloud, as the boy had said. But Brimlad sucked in a sharp breath, and in a grim voice he said, That is no cloud. It is a sail, and by the looks of it the sail of some mighty ship indeed. He spat over the railing, and a gob of thick brown phlegm vanished into the water. A thrill of fear ran through Lauren. Whose ship? Have we anything to fear? I would wager so, said Brimlad. No port we have passed has held any ship like that one. That means they are from Redbrook, and they have been sailing day and night to catch us, just as we have been sailing day and night to flee. But I do not understand. How have they caught up? Lauren was annoyed to hear a high edge of panic in her own voice. Spots danced at the edge of her vision. She was nearly starved. They all were. No matter how fast they sailed, we had a strong lead, and you said that with Zane's magic, no ship in Redbrook could catch us. Brimlad's look was grim. I would wager they have themselves some kind of witchery on board, same as us. That roused Zane's attention. With his hand on the tiller, he rose and looked towards the sail. Will they catch us before we reach Wellmont? Yes, said Brimlad flatly. Their wizard is better fed than you are. The gap will only narrow, and now that they have caught sight of us, they will expend every effort to speed that narrowing. I think we have a day, may up two, before they are close enough to take us. And what will happen then? said Jem. Zane looked at him with hooded eyes. Then they will capture the girl and kill the rest of us. If we are lucky, they will be quick about it. Annis rose slowly and walked towards them with leaden feet. Not if I commanded them to leave you. I have angered my mother, certainly, but as her daughter my words must still have weight. Even a young lass like you cannot be fool enough to believe that, growled Brimlad. Annis raised her chin, nostrils flared and lips quivering. Very well, then, she said, and her voice almost broke. Put me ashore. I will wait for them here. They will not pursue you once they have claimed me, and you will be safe. Brimlad's lips twisted, and he looked to Zane with a shrug. 
She might have something there. I think it means our skins if we do anything different. We cannot, cried Lauren. You would abandon this girl back to the clutches of her mother? Captain, you do not know the fate you consign her to. Then offer a better idea, said Brimlad, and again he spat off the side. For if we do not do as she says, they will catch and kill us all, and then they will have the girl regardless. Her way, at least we get to live. He is right, Lauren, said Annis. It was always a fool's hope that I could escape. You all should go. You can still make it to Kalenton, or anywhere else that you choose. Lauren's mind leaped ahead of Annis even as she spoke, and she cut the girl off with a sharp wave. We will make good our escape, and with you besides. Zane, a moment. The wizard gave Lauren a curious look, but he gave the tiller back to Brimlad and followed her to the bow. There Lauren huddled close and kept her voice low. The Maidstones, do you know where we can sell them? He arched an eyebrow. I know a place. It is far to the north of here, in Dorsey to the west of the Great Rock Mountains, a city known as Bertram, where a friend could assist me. And for how much? I imagine they must be valuable. Zane shook his head. Beyond your reckoning, but I cannot see how this will help. The dragon's tail does not lead to Bertram, nor could we hope to reach it before we were caught, and even then gold would do us no good against... Hunger stoked Lauren's temper, and she interrupted with a frustrated growl. I am not a fool, wizard. I am trying to strike you a deal. With the value of half the maidstones, could Annis and Jim buy passage to Kalenton and make lives for themselves there? Zane looked irritated in his turn, but he shrugged. Of course, they could live like royalty, for a long while at least. And would half the maidstones be enough for you to reclaim your son from the High King's seat? Zane's eyes flashed, and his face frightened her for a moment. With half, I could conquer a kingdom, he said, and his voice was terrible. Lauren felt a qualm at that, but she pressed on. Then we will keep our course for Wellmont. Mayup Brimlad overestimates our pursuers, and we will reach the city without incident. But if they catch us, we will give you one of the crystals. With its power, do you think you could stave off the ship that pursues us? Excitement sparked in his eyes, and he gave a quick nod. I could render it to kindling and sink the splinters to the river's bed. He grew solemn again, but I would rather not, not unless our plight was desperate indeed. Then do not destroy the ship, said Lauren impatiently. Only damage it enough that they cannot make good their chase. I mean that I would rather not use the mage stones unless I must. As for why, it is a matter for wizards. Tell me, said Lauren, for without this plan we are lost. But if it works, and we reach Wellmont in safety, then we can finish the deal. We will procure passage to Bertram, and give you half of the mage stones. The other half we will sell to your friend, and with the coin, Annis and Jem can travel to Kalenton. But if this will not work, you must tell me now. Again she saw hunger grow in the wizard's eyes. Half of them? You would do this for me? Not for you said Lauren, sniffing and raising her chin. For both of us, a mutually beneficial transaction. Two people walking outside the king's law together, doing what is best for both of them. Zane grunted. Call it what you will. Still, to use the stones now. He turned from Lauren and looked back towards the sail on the horizon. To Lauren it looked to have grown bigger even in the short time they had spoken. What? You look like a man who spies a coming danger. Zane opened his mouth and then closed it again. Something changed in his face. It became a mask, firm and stony, as though behind his eyes some arrangement had been made. It will be as you say, said Zane. We will keep the girl with us, and I will try to best the ship without use of the stones. I have told you that few wizards can match my power. Yet you are half-starved and weakened because of it, said Lauren. 
You must promise me that you will use the stones if you must, or else we are all lost. As I said, at utmost need. And one more thing, girl. You must not tell Brimlad of this. Even in the heat of it, when I fight their wizard, if I must take the mage stone, I must do it in secret, so that the captain never sees. Lauren did not like his tone, the sudden resolution that had filled him. She felt that he held something back, some secret he feared for her to learn, but she saw little choice other than to place her trust in him. In the back of her mind a voice whispered, He left you upon the High King's road. She did not listen. Your word, she said, and offered her hand. My word. The wizard took Lauren's wrist in a firm grip, though hers was firmer still. This has been a production of Legacy Books, written and narrated by Garrett Robinson. The music in this podcast was created by Will Musser. Check out his incredible work at willmusser.com. That's W-I-L-L-M-U-S-S-E-R.com. Today's letter is N. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. <laughs>